So we, because our senses ultimately <coughs> verify these kinds of errors, then we are simultaneously affirming our trust in them, even as we call them into question. So there's something very <coughs> funny going on here. So if you look at this, for example, I'm not sure if it works on the big screen, but certainly in a smaller uh, venue, you can get the feeling of motion, right? But on the other hand, you know it's an illusion, right? We know it's a visual illusion. So you're simultaneously being told by your senses two things at the same time, that, it, that it's stationary and it's not stationary. And of course, what's actually moving are the saccadic movements in your eyes that are making perceptual ge uh, perspectival guesses, which gives you the illusion. So the senses simultaneously um, tell you that there's an illusion going on. Now, in the West, we have a long tradition after the Enlightenment period of idealism, where philosophers have eschewed these, these great views, like uh, David Hume says, it makes no less sense <coughs> to leave the building through the third floor window than to walk out to the first floor door. Because he says, it's, because it's just an illusion that one is better than the other. Of course, he never walked out of the third floor window, so that's a little kind of interesting. So um, there's, uh, there's basically four different ways the idealists have explained perception, you know, why does science work if perception is uh, illusory. And the first one is a transcendent argument. The transcendent argument says there's a transcendent consciousness that governs things and we're in tune with that and the transcendent consciousness is also governs the laws of reality and because that transcendent consciousness is kind of controlling both then uh, our perception has some correspondence with reality. That's the transcendent argument. The other argument that Kant made, for example, is the transcendental argument. No, there's no transcendent consciousness, but there's something about our mind that has these transcendental faculties like pure reason, logic, mathematics, and science. And if you use your mind in this way, then it gives you an accurate map of what reality is, although we can never actually know reality. So that's the transcendental argument. A little later on in the modern world, we have the argument of the positive. So you still you see most of reality is still uh, we can't get at, but because there are fixed causation, causal laws of the universe, there's a whole causal sequence that linearly makes the what's real um, through all these causative laws uh, take place in our mind, and because the laws are consistent, then there's some kind of correspondence. And most of us today, most philosophers and neuroscientists have a naive view of perception as representational. That there's neural correlates, there's somehow a causal thing here, and the neural correlates create neural representations of the world, and then we primarily go on and participate with neural representations, not so much with the world itself. So these are all different correspondence theories of reality. There's all explanations for why our perception is not exactly correct, but it <coughs> corresponds somehow to the world. Now the problem with this is it leads to what I call locked-in syndrome. This sense that we are actually locked in our heads and that we either need technology or God or some kind of third term to get at the world, and it really creates I think, a horrible metaphor, a horrible kind of existential situation. So, but there's something weird about locked-in syndrome. So you see this picture, you know, the guy's locked in, right? I mean, he's out in the world, but really, what is he participating with? He's locked inside his own head. Or, you know, he's got someone looking down at him, his girlfriend, and a car, and the business, and this and that. But here's the thing. Most of us can actually relate to this, but most of us think our dog sees this. <laughs> so, like, what's wrong with us? Do we not have the mammalian perceptual uh, system? Do we not have this capacity? So you see, if I put it up this way, you notice that sometimes as a philosopher you think this, but when you go home, you're pretty much sure that this is what's 
collaborating with your dog, and of course, that's the real reason why the dog is happy with you. Okay? So, what's going on? We, we seem to be holding, holding these two things simultaneously. So, the point here is it all depends what you're participating with. If you're participating with this, yeah, you're going to say, oh, I've got locked in syndrome. But if you can learn to participate with this, then you will realize that actually the world, you, you can let the world in in this very simple, beautiful way. For example, perception is keyed into action. If you read the book, The Physics of Baseball, you will find that for a catch like this to be made over the back of his you know, a head in the outfielder, first the fielder must start to run before he hears the crack at the back. He cannot trace that ball in its trajectory. He cannot look over the back of his head and knows where it goes, and yet he can make this catch. And the reason why is because all his perceptual acuity is completely, 100% accurately match the world. You cannot say that perception is illusory or merely appearance and understand how this is possible. It's just not true. It depends what you're participating with. But of course, when athletes reach this kind of performance, what they're not participating with is emotions and thoughts and fantasies and fears and uh, <laughs> mental concepts. And often they're not even participating with a sense of an I, me, or a mind. Mm -hmm. So what makes perception possible is not adding something to experience, but it requires being able to drop much of what limits our actual lived experience. It, it, it requires us to be able to learn how to drop that, mm -hmm. to stop being distracted. <coughs> so, whoops, one thing, sorry. So there's a group of people, if you read the book, Rise of Superman, they're adding meditative practices to extreme sports to actually learn how to do this directly, to get back into the world and mine the real world through our perceptual acumen for um, more potential. So in philosophy, this started to be reclaimed by the American pragmatist. Uh, William James says, the intellectual life of man consists almost wholly in his substitution of the conceptual order for the perceptual order from which his experience originally comes. So any philosopher of consciousness must be, needs to be able to realize when they're talking about the real world of perception, are, are they really joggling around conceptions in their head? Are they really just mapping concepts onto other concepts in the mind? Is, is infinitely creative, so that can create a lot of infinite interesting ideas and theories. But is it saying anything about the world if you can't trace it directly down into the experience? So a lot of people know this man is Carl Jung. A lot of people think of him as making that mistake, as think of the whole life of a human being in their, being in their psychic or archetypal experience. But later on, later on in life, he concluded this. The deeper layers of the psyche lose their individual uniqueness as they retreat farther and farther into the darkness. As they approach the autonomous functional systems, they become increasingly collective until they are universalized and extinguished in the body's materiality. Hence, at bottom, then he traced the psyche all the way to its bottom. What did he find? The material world. Same thing with this man. He says, truth does not inhabit only the inner man, or more accurately, there is no inner man. Man is in the world, and only as the world does he know himself. So we're all uh, scientists of uh, consciousness, perception by the numbers. The body receives about 16 million bits of information through its perceptual organs, uh, broadly defined. The conscious mind can manipulate concepts from between 16 and 42 bits of information. 99% of what we will talk about today is this. One tenth of one millionth 
of what is actually conscious in a human being. This is probably an oversight, I would argue. <laughs> okay? So this is how it works. What are we participating with at any moment? Uh, this is a complex diagram on the left, but it just shows that in the, at, at the level of mind space, information is deselected, right? So from 16 million bits of information goes through all these neural gates until you get these chunks. And those chunks are made up of a tiny bit of perceptual information <coughs> and memories and fantasies and ideas and concepts, and they get chunked together as a uh, experience. So, for example, if this is not a person, what is it, right? There's very, very, very little perceptual information on the screen. And just feel what it does to you, right? right? So what are you participating with? What comes online when I put this up? If this is not a person, what is it? Right, so basically you have some white and black perceptual some angle. But what comes online when I put it up there? What are you participating with? Right? Not, not a lot of perceptual experience, but something is coming online. What are you participating with? So there's a little more perceptual information here, some a little more color, a little more graininess, a little more uh, sculpting, right? But what are you participating with? You're not participating with the perceptual information of this. So I would argue, and this is why it matters, because this is not a perception, it's a stimulus. If you watch now your life from this orientation, you will realize that you're just being hyper-stimulated by media and technology and social drama and all the time. And you're not actually living all that is in the background, waiting for you to touch base with it, waiting for you to be alive with the information of the universe that's coming from your lived body. And basically, we're participating with all this stimulus. 99% of your energy is probably reacting to stimulus, not perception stimulus. OK, so how am I doing for time? Not good. Um, <laughs> So the, so the background, these are really cool slides, but you're not getting seen. So <laughs> what, we want, what, I, what I know from my research of different experiments, meditative experiments, is that, that 60, all those 16 million bits, what are they doing? Well, there's a lot of information coming from the world. And then here's our <coughs> sensory. And what the background is, what the background, all that 16 million, there's three primary <coughs> processing modes. And what, what, what happens in the body mind brain is that uh, each one of these is a perceptual organ. And, and one subsystem processes all that information and creates exterior receptive space. So some of you may have had the experience of deep meditation, or when you're falling asleep, if you uh, almost if you're a lucid dreamer, where all the perception goes away, all the thoughts go away, your body perceptions go away, and then you just get a tremendous expansion into three-dimensional space. Right? This is the exterior perception. The body takes your hearing, which is three-dimensional, sight, your circadian <coughs> the way your body moves in space, and says the fundamental reality is spaciousness. And this is well documented in subsystems in the uh, body, mind, brain, and recent neuroscience. A second subsystem takes all that serial processing, puts it into a, uh, a uh, uh, background foundational perception that's interior sector. And this is my basic body well-being. Are my limbs connected? Is my head where it's supposed to be? And so that's how we 
guide ourselves as three-dimensional pieces of the world in a three-dimensional world. And then the third system is proprioceptive, which allows us to take skillful action in the world. And the three of them together create, takes up much of that 16 million bits of uh, information to enable experience to be possible. Now, the interesting thing about um, this slide is that anytime you trace a perception down to its finer and finer detail, so for example, in, in proprioception requires me to be balanced. And part of the system of balancing is a little, uh, little grain of calcium that sits on a saddle in my ear. And as I move around, that grain of calcium moves around. So if I say, if I then talk about that grain of calcium, it's a grain of calcium. It sounds like world, right? So when I trace any, any perceptual organ in my body, if I trace it down to what's actually happening, I get to a point where I'm talking about the world. What is it about the calcium? If I start talking about chemistry, if I trace light going into my eye, eventually I start talking about quantum effects on the retina, right? So in the, this is why we can trust perception. Because when we trace it down, we get to the point where conceptually, we don't know if it's the world or if it's us. And so that, at that <coughs> intersection, I call that the hylozoic zone. It's where the body and the world are so friendly grains, so friendly tuned to each other, that it's, they're, they're, it's an interface that's so fuzzy, you can't tell which is which. And this is why we can trust perception. Hylozoic means it's a philosophical position that says only the mind is making a strong conceptual cut between what's material and what's living. So you can, you can through meditative practices, actually touch base with this zone. So if you did, you would have this kind of experience. You would have the sense of becoming luminous. Things were becoming luminous before my eyes. They shone in a riot of colors that continuously increased in intensity. I looked back and it was as if they were all made of stained glass with sunlight shining through them. The scene became a living, scintillating dance of glory. The darkness of the trees and hills became shining purple and blue. This is all the information is coming through the threshold of this person's consciousness. The sense of me at a fixed location in space and time expanded. This, this is the exterior receptive ask information of the body coming into awareness, into a less consciousness perception. Instead of seeing that living light, I became the light. The whole circle of the horizon was before my eyes simultaneously. So these are, uh, as I'm going to call this experience, Ken show. And through meditative practices, you can learn to distinguish the component aspects of your experience. So you can open the space, have more, more choice, move the distractions and the stimulus out, get deeper and deeper in touch with where the world and you are arising as one. So thank you. Thank you.